Today on Newswatch, looking for answers, the people of Belgium still reeling after Monday's terror attack see what's ahead as authorities work to dismantle the growing network of Islamic terror in Europe. Plus, hashtag hope will show you how Christians are using social media to encourage prayers and shed light in the wake of the terror attacks in Belgium. And if you had a same-sex couple walk into your church and say they would like to get married, what would your response be? A pastor answers tough questions about homosexuality. Hear what he had to say about gay marriage. Thanks for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Police in Belgium arrested one of the suspects in the Brussels bombings today. Authorities are moving fast to hunt down any terrorists tied to the attack that killed at least 34 people. And as Dale Hurd reports, police have named two men they believe carried out the suicide bombings. Belgian police have arrested one of the suspects in the attack. The man shown wearing the hat is Najim Lakraoui. One day after a series of deadly attacks in Brussels, security was at its highest level, with soldiers checking passengers' belongings at the entrances of some of the metro stations in the city. This woman said, I am absolutely not annoyed by this. If this needs to continue, there is no problem because it is for our security. It's just yeah. so no, annoying right that now, there so. are people who are doing this kind of stuff that is really stupid. Nine Americans were among the hundreds wounded in the attack. American missionary Rocky Gathrate told CBN News he had just dropped off a friend at Brussels airport when the blast occurred. The second explosion was seemed like it was right beside me. All the windows and all the glass just shattered and came exploding out towards the street. Gathrite went in to help and minister to victims, and he prayed with an airline employee. Police have identified two of the attackers as Khalid and Brahim Bakrawi. The brothers were known to police for past crimes, but nothing related to terrorism. Both blew themselves up in the attack. Khalid Bakrawi had rented an apartment raided by police last week in an operation that had led authorities to the top suspect in the Paris attack, Salah Abdeslam. The Belgian ambassador to the United States said that in those raids, police discovered evidence a major attack in Belgium was being planned. The context of prior house searches who took place in Brussels, different places in Brussels, there were indications that something was in the offing. A lot of heavy weapons have been found, which is an indication that something was uh, perhaps uh, being planned for the next few days. But Belgian police were still not able to prevent an attack, and it has cast a spotlight on what some have called a shocking level of unpreparedness by Belgian authorities. An unnamed Belgian official told BuzzFeed News, we just don't have the people, we don't have the infrastructure to properly investigate or monitor hundreds of individuals suspected of terror links, as well as pursue the hundreds of open files and investigations we have. It's literally an impossible situation, and honestly, it's very grave. A senior U.S. official reportedly said that Belgian authorities know they're sitting on a time bomb. And Dale is here. You've reported from Brussels many times. What's been the reaction in Europe? Uh, d a day later, some of the predictable political correctness that uh, let's be careful now and not scapegoat all Muslims. And of course, no one's doing that. Most Muslims are not terrorists. Mm -hmm. But almost all terrorists these days are Muslims. It's a serious problem. But the, the media, political correctness has such a lock on the mindset in Europe that the European media is already you know, moving in, you know, with the gospel of multiculturalism and let's make sure that, you know, uh, some people don't even want the migrant flows to slow down because of this. I mean, that's where they're at. Wow. Why would terrorists pick Brussels for the attack? Is it because of NATO, the EU? Why there? Uh, you know, you would have to ask them, but it's a very easy target, and I have wondered why this hasn't happened sooner, because as I suggest in my report, Belgian uh, uh, law enforcement is uh, suspect. Uh, it's now become apparent to uh, the rest of the world that uh, the Belgian uh, authorities may be in over their heads, mm. and they have, it is, as I have described, a, a veritable jihadi barracks in Brussels. Uh, it, some of the worst terrorists in Europe, we know now, reside in Brussels. And some of these attacks were done 
uh, less than a mile away from where they live. Wow. Now, you have said in your report that there were warnings. Why ignore them? I, well, again, I think it's because it's the problem with uh, Belgian counterterrorism. So you have to understand, I mean, I don't want to put people to sleep at this hour with a mm -hmm. history lesson, but Belgium has been a troubled state for a long time with divided governments and for some years, no government mm -hmm. because of uh, in, uh, a lack of consensus uh, in parliament. And this has impacted law enforcement. And they have, in the opinion of many, weak law enforcement, weak counterterrorism. I don't think this attack would have been, uh, they would have been able to pull it off in, say, the UK or the United States. Mm. Wow. Now, they just arrested one of the men behind the Paris attacks. But can some of these terrorists hide in plain sight? I don't know about that, but um, uh, the way that Europe has not integrated some of these areas, they have communities they can hide in, mm -hmm. like Molenbeek, uh, that are highly concentrated immigrant and Muslim areas. And, you know, we had anecdotal reports yesterday of children in Belgium, Muslim children, cheering in school over these attacks. That's anecdotal. It was on social media. I, I didn't have a chance to verify it. But that, there, part of that rings true in the sense that you have these isolated communities where terrorists can hide and you have people that feel uh, they're not a part of Belgian society and that in fact they're not Belgian, they're from the Middle East or from North Africa and they might be ready to help a terrorist hide. Oh, all right, Dale Hurd, thank you so much for your reporting, much appreciate it. While our terrorists are celebrating the attack online, Christians around the world are praying for Brussels. Charlene Aaron has a recap of what's been taking place on social media. While ISIS and its supporters celebrated the deadly attacks in Brussels on social media with the hashtag Brussels Burns, many Christians from across the world also took to Twitter to offer their support and their prayers. And we here at CBN, we join in those prayers. We're praying for God's peace, God's protection, and his blessing over the entire region, as well as for the families of the victims who lost their lives. And also members of the Christian community, like Kenneth Copeland, he's a Christian leader. He took to Twitter and he said, please pray for Belgium. We will not allow terror to reign. We declare Jesus is Lord over Belgium. And Reverend Franklin Graham also took to Twitter. He says, pray for the people of Brussels, Belgium after today's terror attacks. And on Facebook, Joyce Meyer Ministries, she posted three explosions went off in Brussels, Belgium, killing 34 people, wounding 170 more. Today, we stand in prayer for the people of Belgium, that God is our hope. And the Israel Defense Force also tweeted today saying, terror strikes the heart of Europe again. We stand with Belgium and pray for the victims and for their families. And on Instagram, where people post pictures, more than 85,000 pictures have been posted with the hashtag, pray for Brussels. This is Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Just hours after the Brussels attacks, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told the annual pro-Israel gathering of AIPAC there is no difference between the terrorism in Brussels and in Israel. Speaking via satellite, Netanyahu said there's only one way to fight it. The chain of attacks from Paris to San Bernardino, to Istanbul, to the Ivory Coast, and now to Brussels, and the daily attacks in Israel, this is one continuous assault on all of us. What they seek is our utter destruction and their total domination. Their basic demand is that we should simply disappear. Well, my friends, that's not going to happen. Netanyahu said the only way to defeat terrorism is to come together and fight it together with political unity and moral clarity. Republican Donald Trump and Democrat Hillary Clinton came out on top in the Tuesday primaries, but Ted Cruz and Bernie Sanders also shared victories. Trump and Clinton won the prized Arizona primaries, with Trump gaining all 58 delegates in that state. But Cruz won all 40 of the GOP delegates in Utah. 
Sanders beat Clinton in Utah and in the Idaho caucuses, gaining a handful of Democratic delegates. Cruz's win in Utah follows the Brussels attacks and his statement that authorities should patrol Muslim neighborhoods to prevent radicalization. The Supreme Court is taking up a case of faith-based groups defending their religious freedom against Obamacare. Religious nonprofits like Little Sisters of the Poor object to the HHS mandate that forces them to provide contraceptive and abortion-causing drugs. They argue providing those drugs violates their beliefs. We are the believers. And so when we say, when we draw the line between uh, action that is acceptable or unacceptable to our faith, we are the final and only judges of where that line belongs. So what we're saying to the government is, you have to respect our beliefs and give us an exemption from this mandate that would make us involved in activities we see as evil. Only eight justices will hear the case because of the vacancy left by Justice Scalia's death. The Kansas governor signed legislation that will protect religious groups on college campuses. The new law allows faith-based college groups to restrict membership to like-minded members. Kansas already had a religious objections law, but it didn't extend to college clubs and organizations. Critics say the law is an attempt to legalize discrimination, but supporters say it is a victory for religious freedom. The law takes effect in July. Gospel recording artist James Fortune has begun a five-day jail sentence for assaulting his wife. Texas jail records show he turned himself in Monday night at a correctional facility about 20 miles outside Houston. Fortune pleaded guilty earlier this month to assaulting his wife during an argument in 2014. He must also serve five years of probation, do community service, and not have any contact with his wife. The Grammy-nominated singer's hits include Hold On and I Trust You. Coming up, we hear from a missionary on the scene of the Brussels bombings. Hear his reaction as the explosions erupted around him. A missionary who survived Tuesday's bombings as he drove away from the Brussels airport ran back and started helping people. Rocky Gathright is a missionary with Four Corners Global. CBN News anchor Mark Martin spoke with him about his experience Tuesday as the terror attack unfolded around him. Rocky, you were dropping off a friend at the airport, I understand, when the bomb went off. Describe what happened. Yes, we just arrived at the airport. Uh, we have a little drop-off zone, so I, I dropped off my friend. As we proceeded on, there was an explosion right behind me. Uh, I'm driving in a lane right next to the airport, and um, I wasn't aware that it was an explosion. It sounded like a car crash. Uh, but then the people started pouring out of the building and I was stuck in a place where the people had to get to the other side of the road. And so another explosion happened about eight uh, seconds after the first one. And the second explosion was, seemed like it was right beside me. All the windows and all the glass just shattered and came exploding out towards the street. Well, how did you respond in the aftermath of the explosion? My first concern was to get back to my friend to see where he was, make sure I didn't, you know, if I needed to drag him out of the building or, but uh, I was just thinking, you know, let's just park the car and let's just go and, and, and see what we can do. And, but as I got out of the car, you know, there was a lady covered with blood coming out of the building. So I immediately started helping her. Uh, she was okay. I found my friend at first, and he was he was already safe. And uh, then we just began to talk with other people uh, around us, people that were still crying and still shaking. I talked with one airline employee. Uh, she uh, she works in security in the building, but she had uh, had an injury herself. So I I walked up to her and had a nice five minute discussion with her and asked her if I could pray for her. She said yes. She said, um, I said to her, I said, well, do you believe in God? Because um, uh, you never know who, who does and who doesn't. Um, and she said, uh, yeah, after a moment like this, yes, I do. Well, Rocky, what's the mood of the people of Brussels right now? There seems to be a lot of fear. What I'm concerned about is, is possibly uh, a backlash of anger to come, to come next. What about the role of the church in Brussels? I mean, does the city have a strong church, Rocky? 
Brussels has a minority community for, for Bible believing Christians. Um, uh, the, the city of Brussels, it might be at most 5% Bible believing Christians. And I'm, I'm praying that the Christian church will actually stand up and really take a, take a lead on helping people, helping, he, helping the healing process. Uh, before we go in this interview, if you don't mind, I'm going to pray for you and everyone that's in the middle of this right now, if that's okay. Yes, yes. We, we, we covered the prayers. We, we feel like uh, not just for protection for the city, but really just pray for the, the, for the, for the gospel to go forth, for there to be strong uh, strength in the Christians, that they will stand up and share their faith, share their testimonies with others, bring comfort to the people of Belgium. Okay, let's pray. Father God, I lift up Rocky to you, and uh, first of all, I lift up the people in Brussels to you, and I pray, dear Lord, that you would be with them. I pray that you would heal every victim. I pray that no one else loses their lives. I pray that the people that are responsible for this would be brought to your perfect justice. Dear Lord, I pray that Christian revival happens in Brussels and in Belgium. I pray that, that you would be with the church, the Christian church in Belgium, and I pray that they would rise up and do what they're called to do for such a time as this. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would anoint them, and I thank you, dear Lord, for what you're going to do. I pray that the church would be strong and that they would be bold, and I pray that you would prepare the hearts of the people who are going to receive the gospel message. And again, I pray that many, many, many people accept you, Lord Jesus, as their Lord and Savior through this, through this horrible tragedy. Thank you that you're in control, dear God. We just pray that you would turn all of this around for good. We pray all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Up next, a pastor's approach, how to stay true to the Bible and still reach gay men and women with the gospel of grace. Americans who pray or believe in God hit an all-time low in 2014, but a slightly higher percentage do believe in an afterlife. That is according to new research from San Diego State, Florida Atlantic, and Case Western Reserve. The biggest declines in faith came among younger Americans, 18 to 29. Research team leaders say the large declines in religious practice among young adults are also further evidence millennials are the least religious generation in memory and possibly in American history. We're continuing our special report called Homosexuality, a Christian View. Today, we look at church leadership, those who want to reach gays and lesbian with the good news of Jesus Christ, not to mention navigating their way through the issue of gay marriage. Our George Thomas sat down with his pastor to get his take on these turbulent times. If you had a same-sex couple walk into your church and say they would like to get married, what would your response be? I would say, I want to talk to you at length about this. It's, it's worth more than a soundbite. Mm -hmm. And then I would share with them how I respect their conscience and how God is shaping them. And, but I, I also ask them to respect my conscience mm -hmm. and my conscience would not allow me because of a, my view of the Bible to officiate this marriage. You would decline? Oh, I certainly decline, without doubt. Do you consider homosexuality as a sin? I consider not only I consider, I, I think the Bible is categorical on it, that homosexual acts are unequivocally sin. But you, I want to add to that, so is premarital sex, so is pornography, so is fetishes, so you name it. And the, the list is gigantic. So yes, it's a sin, but to isolate it out of a, out of a larger Christian sexual ethic, to me, uh, is unfair to the to 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 having a civil discussion about it. How do you in the in that scenario that you've described? How do you then help the church better understand, better articulate what our faith says about the issue of homosexuality to the public? I would encourage them first to exhale. Meaning? Homosexuality has been around <laughs> in every generation and in every culture. So this is not a new phenomena. Exhale, we don't have to defend God. The biggest part, George, is the attitude of the heart of the church. Do we love sinners? Do we love them? And if they're homosexual or not, do we love them? When you first began in the ministry, did you 
deal with these kinds of issues? Nope. Never discussed. And when it was discussed, it was done in, a, in an unkind way. Mm. You have jokes. And, you know, I, I pastored a long time. There are men that are effeminate that are living celibate lives or are living heterosexual lives. And they have been bullied and pillared since they were in junior high. And that ain't right. How have you advised your leadership on tackling this issue? Right. The best statistics I've heard re is that about 2 to 3 percent of, of, of an average population would confess the same sex attraction. And um, so our church, that would mean we'd have 100, 200, 300 people that are coming to Sunday service. The vast majority would not confess the same sex feeling to anybody. Would you want to share your struggle with a pastor that's condemning, that's angry, that would be shocked? You see, until somebody can confess their sin without embarrassment or laughter, they're never going to share it with you. And if we're going to be missional in a postmodern world, we have got to exhale, process our philosophy of ministry, and see this as a divine opportunity. To me, I, to me, I think it's been a wake-up call. Because the church needs to, I think, reevaluate how we approach all sinners. Come out of the ivory tower. How do you have a relevant gospel where you're still prophetic that right is right and wrong is right, and yet you're pastoral and say, I love you unconditionally, even without change? To see full interviews, other resources, visit our website, cbnnews.com uh, slash Christian View. Stay with us. We're coming right back. Time now for your Wednesday word, and today's word is love. I woke up this morning with a sweet reminder. God's love is unmerited, unconditional, and unending. It is also very often uncomprehensible. There is no greater love. Take time to soak in that love today and make this a wonderful Wednesday. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. We'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do that on Facebook or at CBN News on Twitter. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Once again, make this a wonderful Wednesday.